Hello and welcome to another lecture of ECE 108 and the first lecture that I'm completely making for scratch this term. So if you notice some differences in how the lecture's made, that's because of that. Okay, so in this lecture we want to further examine the idea of mathematical induction and try to see how far we can take this method. Okay, so explicitly, even though it may look like at first glance, that induction can only be applied to particular cases, such as the examples I gave in the previous lecture, it actually turns out that induction can be generalized to a pretty big set of problems. Okay, so in this lecture we're going to re-examine induction and show how we can expand it out and some of the limitations when we go to try to expand induction. Okay, so at the end of the last lecture, uh, in the meme, I said that we could use induction on Z. Uh, so let's show that that meme is actually correct and give an example of using induction on Z. Okay, so say if I wanted to use induction to prove this statement that for all N and Z, 3 divides N cubed minus N. Okay, so before we get into how to use induction here, let's talk about this idea of divides. So here, when I say that uh, 3 divides this, all I'm really saying is that if I take this n cubed minus n and divide it by 3, I am left with an integer. Okay, so just defining that quantity here for the purpose of this question. Okay, so here, we know that induction only really works on n, at least in the way that we've built it so far. So how can it possibly be used to solve this question? Z is not n and there's numbers in Z that aren't in N, so how can we do this? Well, one way we can go about doing it is to just use case analysis along with induction. So to be explicit, we can do induction twice. One, we can apply induction for all integers N greater than or equal to zero, and we can show that three has to divide this. And two, we can then show that for all integers N less than or equal to one, then N divi or three divides this N cubed minus N. Okay, so one thing to be careful of, in the second case, here our induction is going to be slightly different because we're talking about decreasing values of n instead of increasing values of n. Namely, instead of showing that p of n implies p of n plus 1, we show p of n implies p of n minus 1. Okay, so if we take these two cases and put them together, we can see that this very clearly covers all of the cases of the original statement. And in practice, it's actually okay to have overlapping cases for these two C1 and C2, and that actually can help us reduce the amount of work we need to do. Uh, in particular, and oftentimes, we will replace the C2 with n is less than or equal to zero, and then we have the same base case when we prove C1 and C2, which saves us a little bit of work there. Okay, I want to end with one more method that you can use to uh, use induction to apply it to methods like this. You can first show your standard induction, so just to be explicit here. Another way of tackling this problem is, one, we could first show that p of zero is true. We could then use induction to show that p of n for n is greater than or equal to zero is true. And then finally, instead of doing induction again for n is less than or equal to zero, we could show that p of n implies that p of negative n is true. So if we did this last step, this would show that since it's true for n greater than zero, then it would be true for n less than zero as well. Okay, so oftentimes you might see this as an alternative to doing two full-out induction proofs, but for this lecture, I'm just going to do two full-out induction proofs. It gives you some good examples of inductive proofs, so I find it useful to do that here. Okay, so let's make a formal proof using this case method as opposed to using this uh, inductive method, this other method here. Okay, so instead of doing the rough work first, let's just jump straight into the formal proof because we've seen a few examples of working out the rough work, and generally it's the formal proofs in that writing process that students kind of struggle with here. Okay, so let n be an integer, and let p of n be the proposition that n divides n cubed, my, or sorry, 3 divides n cubed minus 3. Okay, so since we're doing case analysis, we'll now start with our overarching case analysis and prove both of the cases via induction and then combine them together. Okay, 
So if n is greater than zero, we will proceed by induction. So for here, our base case would be the case where n is exactly equal to zero. So for base case, if n is equal to zero, then, well, all I need to do is show that three divides this thing. Well, let's just plug it in. Well, since zero is equal to zero to the third minus three, and this thing's divisible by three, namely zero times three is equal to zero, then it holds trivially that this is true, and thus p of zero is true. Okay, so base case done. So now for the inductive case, I want to assume that this statement p of n is true for some k greater than or equal to zero. So let k greater than or equal to zero be an arbitrary integer, and we assume the inductive hypothesis that three divides k cubed minus k. Okay, so now what we wanna do is we wanna show that if this thing is true, if p of k is true, then our p of k plus one is true. Well, let's examine what the proposition here would be for p of k plus one. I would want three to divide this thing where I replace k with k plus one. So let's just examine this expression here when I replace k with k plus one. So uh, that's what we get here, and let's expand this out, right? My goal is somehow to take this expression here and use the fact that k cubed minus k is equal to three times some integer to be able to simplify this out to show that this thing is also divisible by three. Okay, so direct computation, I can expand this cube to get this term here. Okay, pretty straightforward. And now I can combine these terms to get one big polynomial. So here I can note that the one and the negative one would cancel and the three K and the negative K will become a two K. Okay, so now this is what this thing simplifies to and I somehow need to use this fact that three divides this somewhere in here. Well, if I wanna do that, it's kinda of useful to end up with an expression k cubed minus k out of this. So what I'll do is I'll add and subtract k. Okay, so if I do this, I could take the negative k and absorb it here, and I could take the positive k and absorb it here. Okay, so just kinda of verifying this, you can notice, hey, if I simplify this out, I do in fact get this expression here. Okay, so now here, to simplify this term, I want to use my inductive hypothesis. So I say, by the inductive hypothesis, we know that there exists an integer j such that k cubed minus k is equal to 3j. Okay, again, this statement here just comes from the definition of 3 divides n cubed minus n, which we haven't formally defined, but uh, we're only using it for this question, so there we go. Okay, so from here I can now simplify this out. So I can say thus this thing is equal to, well I can replace this with 3j to get this, and now every term has a three involved, so I could factor out the three. Okay, so now my goal was to show that this thing was divisible by three, so here you can pretty clearly see it's going to be divisible by three, but if you want to be a little bit more formal, we can say, hey, since this thing is an integer, then by the definition of divisibility, p of k plus one is true, and thus, by induction, p of n will be true for all integers n greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so that is case one complete. Okay, so now for case two, we either have two options. At this point, we could, if we wanted to, go back to this trick over here, but we're just gonna do another one by induction to give you another example of induction. So if uh, n is less than or equal to zero, we're gonna proceed by induction. Okay, so base case again is n is equal to zero. We've already done this work. So in this context, we can just cite our previous work. Uh, then our work from the base case for C1 tells us that P of zero is true, right? We already proved P of zero was true. We don't have to rehash it here. Okay, so now for the inductive step. Well, it turns out nothing super fancy here happens, and we pretty much rehash the same argument we did before, just with some small algebra details that are different. Okay, so we let K be less than or equal to zero, because that's what we want to prove in this case and we let k be some arbitrary integer that satisfies that inequality, okay? And now we're going to assume the inductive hypothesis holds. So in this case, the inductive hypothesis would be that p of k is true for one of these k's. Nothing changes here, okay? It's just simply that three divides this quantity here. So now my goal is to show that p sub k implies p sub k minus one minus purely because we want to go to more negative numbers as opposed to more positive numbers. Okay, so what I wanna show is that if I plug in k minus one into this, 
this quantity can turn out to be divisible by 3. Okay, so we just repeat the same stuff we did last time. We take this thing and expand it out to get this. We add these two terms together tri pretty trivially to get this. And now, again, I want to have a k to the third minus k. So I now add and subtract k, k again. But here I take the negative k instead of the positive k. Okay, so now I want to use my inductive hypothesis. So again, by the inductive hypothesis, we know that there's an integer j such that this is true. Okay, so now I can replace this whole thing with 3j. And doing that, I get this quantity here where everything has a 3. But notice this sign is different from what we had before. From here, we factor out the 3. And then finally, we notice, hey, this thing is of the form of something divisible by 3. Or more formally, since this thing's an integer, and I get that p sub k minus 1 has to be true. Okay, so from here, I can now say by induction, p of n is now true for all integers n less than or equal to 0. So again, if I want to go to more positive numbers, I use k plus 1. If I want to go to more negative numbers, I use k minus 1. Okay, so then we can just put our two cases together to finish our case analysis proof here. So putting the two cases together gives us that p of n is going to be true for all n and z as desired. Okay, so just kind of thinking of what we did here. So previously we had induction, if I kind of draw a number line here, we had induction that would hold on kind of a half number line thing, right? So here, just draw some ticks in. So here, if I just label these real quick. Okay, so before what we had uh, from the previous lecture was that our induction could work if we had some finite starting point and I just wanted to go further to one direction. Okay, it turns out that that same idea that lets us go in one direction lets us go in the negative direction as well. Like so, if instead of doing pk plus 1, I do p of k minus 1. So if I want to do induction on all of z, all I really need to do is pick some starting point. It doesn't matter which starting point you have, but say if I wanted to start at negative 1, do everything from negative 1 uh, up to uh, infinity going this way with one induction argument, and then I can repeat the thing, same thing with another induction argument going the other way. In practice, it generally works out well that zero would be your starting point, and then you only have to do one base case here. And again, if you do induction going one way, you can do the thing where you show that if it's true here, that this implies this term over here for all of these. So like, 1 implies negative 1, 2 implies negative 2, 3 implies negative 3, and that would be sufficient to avoid have to, having to rehash this induction argument again. Pretty nifty. Hopefully that extension of induction is pretty straightforward. Okay, if it's not, feel free to ask questions because it can get a little complex, as we are about to see. Can we use induction on Q? Well, yes. Induction can be generalized to all of Q. Okay, so you might ask, wait, there's no natural way to put an ordering on Q, right? So if I just go over here for a second, uh, let's just try to order the natural numbers, what well, are the rational numbers. Well, you could say it's kind of natural to start with zero, but what's the next one? Should it be a half? Well, a half's not the smallest uh, rational number, so maybe we should use a third because it's smaller. Well, a fourth is even smaller than this, and this goes on forever, right? Because 1 over n is always going to be bigger than 1 over n plus 1. So we can't really do an ordering in that way of the rational numbers. So how does this work? Well, it turns out that if we can build a algorithm that will let us kind of interweave through all of the rational numbers, then I can use induction on Q. Okay. So basically, even though I can't put an ordering where I say this one is the next natural uh, choice for a rational number, even though that's not a thing, I can still kind of interweave around Q to make this work. There's some deeper principles kind of uh, sitting back behind the reason why this works, and we will discuss those later when we talk about cardinality. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So theorem, induction on Q greater than or equal to zero. Yep. Why q greater than or equal to 0? Well, it turns out that it's easy to do this case. And once I do this case, I can use the same idea that I had before. So explicitly, this thing here where once I get induction for the positive uh, numbers, I can use that to show that induction holds for the negative numbers to extend this idea to all of q. And do note, this is not being tested on. Uh, in practice, I don't think I've ever used induction on 
cue where it was explicitly needed to do induction. It's kind of more for academic uh, I ideas and to show you the scope upon which induction can actually be implied. Okay, so if I want to prove a statement p of r for all q or for all r and q uh, greater than or equal to zero, we first we need to prove a base case. So the base case we're going to prove is going to be on p of one over one. So p of one. Okay. That's kind of odd because zero would be kind of the natural number that you might want to start with, but it turns out that if you start with this, it gives you a nice way to go forward. Okay, so after that, I'm going to prove that if p of a divided by b holds for some integers a and b, where b is not zero, then p of a plus one divided by p of b holds. Okay, so this kind of recovers part of our idea of induction on z, right? Because if I fix b to be one, then this is saying if p of one holds, then p of uh, two holds, if p of two holds, p of three holds, etc. Okay, so this is going to give us all of, say, the integers, if I just start with p of one, well, integers greater than or equal to one, but it doesn't give me smaller fractions, right? It doesn't let me go from one to one half. So to cover the other side, we then prove that if p of a divided by b holds, then p of a divided by b plus 1 holds. And okay, so here this is letting me get to smaller fractions, but how do I actually get to things like, say, 2 divided by 3, because that's not apparently obvious? Well, it turns out that this above works because all positive rational numbers can be obtained from 1, or 1 divided by 1, by a finite sequence of adding one to the numerator or the denominator. So just kind of a priori, you could think, hey, if I give you a rational number of the form, say, a divided by b, then what you could do is you could say, hey, if I start from one over divided by one, and I do the sequence where I keep adding one to the top, so two divided by one, da, 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 up until the point where I get to a divided by one, then I have the a bit, and then I can repeat a similar sequence to get a divided by two, and keep doing this up until I get a divided by b, and then I'm done, okay? So this sequence will always work, okay? It's kind of a nifty little idea here, but the question is like, hey, can you actually prove that these things hold here? And that's where it becomes pretty difficult. Okay, so TLDR, if you want to do induction on Q greater than or equal to zero, you still have the same idea of a one base case, but you have two inductive steps instead of one. Okay, so again, with this above trick, I can then e extend this to all of Q by using the same trick that I used to extend it from N to Z. And kind of a nice way to see this little feature here happening is by examining this thing, the Calkin wolf tree, which I just stole this one from Wikipedia. If you start at one half, you can get to these two values by doing this extension. And then from here, you can just repeat this process forever. And it turns out that all the rational numbers are sitting here precisely because of this argument here. So this extension works. Can I extend it further? Well, it turns out that you can. You can actually extend a form of induction to all of R. And this might be quite surprising that you can do this given some facts that we actually cover later on in this course. So just reading off the text, it's surprisingly enough to do this extension to all R, but not in the way that you might expect. And the reason why the way that you might expect that you could do this, namely kind of this idea where you go through and interweave through all the real numbers, is because of some facts that we're going to cover later on. Namely, you can prove that it's not possible to do an algorithm like this to get to all of the real numbers. But explicitly, these facts are Q has the same number of elements of Z, so I can interweave all of the elements of Z by kind of building this relation between Z and N. Further, Q positive, so the set of all the real, uh, positive rational numbers, has the same number of elements as Z and N. And Q has the same number of elements as the positive rational numbers z and n. But it turns out, and we'll prove this later so you don't have to worry too much now, r has more elements than n. Not all infinities are the same size. And this is a problem for induction because induction really works by saying, hey, you can go one at a time and you can just repeat this process ad infinitum and you can cover all of them. But it turns out that that doesn't work for r. So how do we extend this to R? 
Well, let's give a theorem that's way beyond the scope of this class, and I've never actually in practice done an inductive proof on R. It's just technically possible. So again, you will not be tested on this, but a generalization to all of R uh, greater than or equal to zero is going to be, well, first, I need to show a base case. So here we show that P of zero is true, okay? So after we show the base case, we need to show some potential inductive steps. I say steps because we needed two for Q, so you should expect more than one for R, that allow me to go from the single point zero to everything. So what are the steps I need to do? Well, for any X greater than or equal to zero, if P of X is true for all of these values of X within this closed interval, then P of Y is true for all values of Y within a bigger open interval where Z is something bigger than X. So let's just see what this is really telling me by putting these side by side. So this first step, say if this is my number line over here, my first step, what is this really saying? This is saying that if I have zero located over here, that P of zero is true. Okay, so that's what the first step tells me. It's not too interesting. What does step two tell me? Well, step two tells me that if P of X is true for all Y in some interval, and here X could be equal to zero. So in the first kind of round of going through here, it says, hey, if I have that P of X is true for some interval, let's just draw this in. Okay, so if P of Y holds in here, then if I can show that there is this Z such that P of Y holds in this larger open interval, basically what I'm showing is that there is a value somewhere over here that we call Z, such that if this is true here, then this is true in this larger interval here. Okay, so this is letting me go past this point x. But it turns out that this isn't fit sufficient because this only lets me do one extension. I need to go from here to going on forever, right? So how do we go about doing that? What other conditions do we need? Well, it turns out that you only need one. The last one is for any x and r. If p of y is true on this open interval, then p of x is true. Okay, so what this is really saying in step three, if I kind of draw this out. Here's my interval from zero to x. If my p of y is true here on this open interval, then this implies that I can take this last point here and conclude that p is true there. So what this last step lets me do is it lets me take an open interval and bring it to a closed interval. So if I iterate this, the way that this idea works is as follows. Uh, in terms of the domino analogy, I first start with kind of the number line sitting here like this, and I first start by showing that this is true here. Okay. Then if I show that uh, 2 and 3 are true for all values of x, then I go from this single point, which is a degenerate case of a closed interval, to an open interval. Okay. So this is just some open interval where this is some value. And then in the next step, I can change that to a closed interval. And then via step two from the closed interval, I go to a bigger open interval. And from step three, I can close that interval. And from step two again, I bring that to a bigger interval, then I close it, and I can keep doing this process forever. And this will get me to all of the real numbers. Okay, so it's a little bit fancy. It's definitely beyond the scope of the class, but it's kind of the final form of induction, so to speak. Uh, outside of R, you'd want to go to maybe the complex numbers or something like that. And then this idea of having a succeeding value kind of breaks down. But, I mean, it is actually possible to expand induction to C by doing something similar here. But instead of having intervals, having open circles. But, yeah, we're not going there. Okay, so again, this is not needed for this course. This is beyond the scope of the class. I have never actually personally done an inductive proof using this but it is technically feasible, and I just wanted to give a better idea of the scope of induction. Okay, so it is interesting to see how far induction can go. And speaking of which, well, induction can be further extended in a kind of a different way by just extending the scope of the type of propositions that I can examine via induction. So let's talk about induction with parameters. So here I'm asked to use induction to show that for all integers greater than or equal to zero, everything standard so far, 
And for all real numbers R and theta, okay, how did real numbers get in here? You just said we're not doing induction on real numbers, so why are they real numbers? I don't like this. Well, don't worry, we'll see that this isn't actually hard to work out. Then De Moore's theorem from linear algebra holds explicitly this statement here that this is equal to this is true for all integers in and for all val real numbers r in theta. Okay, so let's do this. Okay, so here I'll just jump to the formal proof again. And what we're going to do is we're going to let r, r and theta be real numbers. And then we're going to let this proposition here be the open statement one. Okay, so a few things to note here. Here I'm using the colon instead of a comma to separate non-parameters from parameters. This is not strictly required, but it does help you kind of keep in your mind what's happening here. So here what I'm doing is I'm letting r and theta just be real numbers, and I'm now examining this uh, proposition that only depends on n, and here I'm treating r and theta as something that you just gave me, okay? So Fred picked two real numbers and gave them to me. I'm just dealing with the p of n for those real numbers that Fred gave me, okay? So now what we're going to do is we're going to prove this new proposition that only depends on n for integers n greater than or equal to zero by induction, okay? And here I'm saying only depends on n because I'm really fixing r and theta at this point where I say let them be real numbers. Okay, so at this point, nothing really changes. I just have these r and thetas that I have to deal with and at every step where I prove something about the proposition p of n colon r theta, I have to show that it works no matter what r and theta are, okay? So let's go through here. Base case. So in this case, the base case would be n is equal to zero. So if n is equal to zero, then this thing is simply going to be this statement here, right? I just replaced n with zero. Well, this is pretty clearly true, right? For any real numbers, r theta and j being my uh, imaginary term here, clearly this thing is going to be one. And on the other side, this will be one. And well, sine of zero is zero, cos of zero is one. So this side will be one. So from here, clearly both sides are equal to one. And thus the base proposition here holds. Okay, so what next? I've done the base case. Now I need to do my inductive step. Well here, nothing fancy changes. I'm doing the same kind of standard induction step. So let's just kind of put our little wording here. So for some integer k greater than is zero, equal to zero, we are going to assume that p of k colon theta colon r holds. Okay, so while it's not strictly required to say this, it does actually help you to figure out how to do the inductive proof sometimes. We'll simply uh, unpack this definition here. If this thing holds, what I'm really saying is that this equality is true for all real numbers r and for all real numbers theta. Okay, so now that I have this, what do I want to show? Well, I want to show that p of k plus 1 is true. Okay, so how can I go about showing p of k plus 1 is true? Well, I know p of k is true, so I know this equality is true. So from here, I could simply multiply this by this quantity here. Okay, so if I multiply by this, on this side, I'm going to get immediately get my uh, term that I want for p sub k on one side of the equation. And then I have this expression here times this that I can then simplify out, right? Like getting the r to the k is pretty trivial, but then multiplying out these trig terms, I need to do some trig stuff. That was done in math 115, so I'm not going to put it here, but if this were given as a thing you needed to prove, you can't simply say, and simplifying gives blah, you need to actually show the steps. But here, just to speed things up, doing this and simplifying by using some trig identities, again, like you've seen in linear algebra, gives that this side here, this expression, is simply equal to this times this. Okay, and again, the r sub k plus one is pretty trivial, but here to get the trig terms to work out, you do need to use a handful of trig identities. It's not long, it's not hard. If you want a refresher, go back to 115 or just ask in Piazza or office hours. Okay, so mod not explaining the details of how I went from here. We can then conclude thus p sub k plus one holds, and by induction, this thing holds for all integers r greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so since we started out with arbitrary real numbers here, and all of this work is valid for uh, all real numbers r and theta, I've used induction to prove a statement that depends on real numbers r and theta. Okay, so this is one way that we can extend induction naturally, and you might see one of these on a homework or a final.
slash midterm, because it's pretty straightforward as an expansion to induction. Okay, so we're now going to examine one final way to extend induction, and that's called strong induction. So in some of the problems in your text, they actually use strong induction without saying that they're using strong induction. And sometimes they use strong induction where you don't need to use strong induction. So just generally speaking, before we get into the details, if you prove something with induction, then that proof also will hold under strong induction. But if you prove something under strong induction, then that may or may not work with a regular inductive proof. So let's kind of get into the details just by going through an example. Okay, so here the Fibonacci sequence is defined by f of n plus 2 is equal to f of n plus 1 plus f of n, where n is greater than or equal to 0, and greater than or equal to 2 is just some integer, and f of 1 is equal to f of 2 is equal to 1. So let's just look at a few examples of this. So the Fibonacci sequence, it starts with 1, and then it does another 1. The next term just adds this plus this, so 2, then it adds 2 plus 1, so 3, adds 3 plus 2, so 5, adds 5 plus 3, so 8, da da da. This sequence goes on forever. Okay, so if I wanted to say what is, say, the 10 millionth uh, Fibonacci number, that would be kind of annoying by doing this process. It's possible, but that would be kind of annoying. So it'd be nice to have a closed form where I can say f of n is equal to blah. Turns out you can do that. So here, show that this recurrence relation can be simplified in the form of this thing here, where this quantity here actually has a name. It's called the golden ratio, and you will see it on assignment two. So there's kind of some deep connections there, but I'm not going to cover that. Okay, so how could I prove that this thing here holds? Well, notice that Fibonacci's numbers are defined for a particular integer, right? So I could potentially use induction to try to prove this. The problem with using induction as we have it to prove this is that it doesn't actually work, right? If you're just doing it with a single case where I just have that p of k is true, then I can't actually prove p of k plus 1 is true. You can prove that that's the case. We're not going to. But uh, induction isn't strong enough here. But if we then kind of... Uh, add an extra hypothesis to induction, namely that p of k and p of k minus 1 is true, then we can actually prove that this works via a version of induction called strong induction. Okay, so let's just give an example of this here by proving this theorem. Okay, so if I look here, this recurrence relation, uh, and by recurrence relation I mean this statement here, is only valid if n is greater than or equal to 2, right? So if I wanted to show that this formula works for all n greater than or equal to 1, then I need to show that it works for f of 1 and f of 2 because these things are defined differently than the rest of the Fibonacci numbers, right? So I'm ultimately going to have two base cases. So let's just jump into the formal proof and then uh, show where that pops up. Okay, so let fn be defined as in the problem statement, namely this recurrence relationship here. And we're now going to use strong induction on this proposition that f of n is equal to this, okay? So here, for our base case, we're going to have two base cases, again, because the two values are needed to actually start the sequence, the 1 and 1. This is given to us as kind of an extra statement outside the recurrence relation. So let's examine these cases. If n is equal to 1, then the proposition up here becomes that f of 1 is equal to this expression here. Well, pretty straightforward thing shows that this is simply equal to 1. So how do I get this? Well, since this is to the first power, I can just add them together. So I get 1 half minus 1 half, which is 0, square root of 5 over 2 plus square root of 5 over 2, square root of 5, multiplied by 1 over square root of 5 does give me 1. Okay, so now for f2, the proposition is simply this thing here. So this, I need to do a little bit more work. Uh, I need to expand out these terms, but it's pretty straightforward. You can show that the stuff in here simplifies to 4 root 5 over 4. Uh, again, 4 coming from squaring everything out. And from here, this is simply 1, which is what f of 2, in fact, was. Okay, so these two base cases, the two particular cases here that I need before I can start using the recurrence relation, uh, this formula works for those. 
Okay, so now I want to do my inductive step. So I'm going to suppose that for some k greater than or equal to 2, p of k and p of k minus 1 both hold. Okay, so here, this isn't my standard induction, right? This is induction with two hypotheses instead of one. It really doesn't actually, like it's not more complex than induction, right? My standard induction, if I use my domino analogy, the standard induction was that if the first domino falls, then if the nth domino knocks down the nth plus one domino, like this, then all the dominoes will fall. Here, my assumption is really that if the first domino falls, and if two things hold, if this domino, the k minus one domino, knocks down this domino, and if this domino knocks down this domino, then all the dominoes fall. It's not really any more fancy, right? And in general, you can actually assume uh, something more stronger that if all of these uh, cases are such that the previous domino knocks down the next domino, then you get kind of the strongest form of induction. But here I only need two of them, and you'll see why shortly. Okay, so if both of these hold, then by the definition of Fibonacci numbers, I have that this f sub k is equal to this thing here, right? That's just my recurrence relationship that I wrote here. Okay, so now since I have these two inductive hypotheses, I can rewrite f sub k and f sub k minus 1 as those formulas, okay? And again, I know that I can do this for these two cases here because I proved the two base cases, right? So if I only would have proved one base case, then one of these formulas here isn't guaranteed to hold and my proof doesn't work, okay? So here, by the inductive hypothesis, I can re least, uh, replace this guy with this, again, because p of k is true, and I can replace this term with this thing here, again, since I'm assuming this case here holds. Okay, so now what I do is algebra. Okay, so here I can replace this guy around by taking this term and putting it over here, basically swapping those two terms, and this gives me this thing here. So here I have this expression here and this expression here. And next I can do some algebra, and I can note this term is equal to this term here. Okay, so explicitly to expand this out, you really want a thing called binomial theorem, which we have not covered yet, we will later. So I'm suppressing the details here, but this is a true statement. I'll do a proof by authority here that this is true. And later on, we can actually prove it, and I actually might make that a homework question later to fill in the detail here, okay? And then from here, you can note that this thing can be rewritten in this form here. This is the thing that I wanted to prove, right? This is, I wanted to show that f of k plus one could be written by this formula here. Therefore, I'm done. Okay, so again here, I used the fact that this thing is exactly equal to this sum here for all x and r. You can take it as an exercise, but you need binomial theorem to prove it, which we don't really have yet. Okay, so from here, I can thus conclude that p sub k plus 1 is true, and by strong induction, p of k is true for all k greater than or equal to 0. 1, greater than or equal to 1, not 0. Okay, so that's an example of strong induction. So really what you can always do if you wanted to, you can replace the inductive hypothesis that p of k is true for some k greater than or equal to k to uh, p sub i is true for all i less than or equal to k for some k greater than or equal to 2. Okay, so basically domino analogy, you don't just, it's okay to assume uh, something stronger than this uh, kth domino knocks down the kth plus one domino, you can in fact assume that all of these previous dominoes knock each other down. Okay, and that's the idea of here of strong induction. Okay, uh, I may not even give you an example of strong induction throughout the course, but I could say on the final or the midterm. It's not particularly hard, but if I ask you to do strong induction, then I would tell you uh, what induction hypotheses I want you to assume, just to make the process of figuring out how to prove the thing a little bit easier. Okay, so that concludes our examination of induction. So kind of TLDR, you can extend induction from n to z, which I do expect you to know how to do those types of proofs for z. Uh, we can then extend induction from z to all of q, which 
you're probably not going to get a question involving that at all unless I really hold your hands doing it. And you can further extend induction or a kind of form of induction from Q to all of R and you're definitely not going to get an example of doing that. And then finally, induction can be extended pretty trivially to a form of induction that's equivalent to induction, but here where I say equivalent, I mean the axioms you need to take are equivalent to induction, but it can be used to solve que questions where induction just doesn't work on its own, right? Like this thing here, you do need these two hypotheses to prove this, which means in turn that you need these two base cases to be proven. Make sure you do that. Okay, so you have no assigned reading from here. Uh, definitely go back, look at those induction questions again, now that you have some better examples of doing an induction and a better idea of the scope upon which induction can apply. So we leave you with meme, induction on R, upgrade, induction on Q, go back, induction on R, I said go back. Okay, so I hope you enjoyed this kind of exploration of how mathematical induction can be generalized. And I will see you in the next lecture where we cover how to decide which proof technique you might want to use on any given problem. See ya.